We could all go. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 54. What? Isaiah chapter 54. You know, you can tell you're getting old when your fingers shake when you're trying to find the right passage. Is that how you tell? <laughs> I thought it was something else. Number four. Maybe four. Five, four. And when you're at the shooting range, you can't hold your gun on the target. It wants to go all over the place. <laughs> Get a, get a bigger target. Yeah, get a bigger target. Isaiah 54. Shout for joy, O barren one, you who have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. And your descendants will possess nations and will resettle the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be put to shame. Neither feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will, not, but you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting loving kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the days of Noah to me, when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. For the mountains may be removed, and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony, and your foundations I will lay in sapphires. Moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies and your gates of crystal and your entire wall of precious stones. All your sons will be taught of the Lord and the well-being of your sons will be great. In righteousness, you will be established. You will be far from oppression for you will not fear and from terror for it will not come near you. <coughs> if anyone fiercely assaults you, it will not be from me. Whoever assaults you will fall because of you. Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work. And I have created the destroyer to ruin. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord and their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Amen. Amen. And we can look at that and look at Israel today. And we can have confidence. No weapon formed against Israel will prosper. But that's not why I read this. I read this because God refers to Israel as a barren Woman. And as we can see in our actual passage for the day that today is that barrenness 
figures in. Barrenness is kind of a symbol of Israel's failure. And Israel's failures are almost overwhelming. <coughs> when you go through the whole Bible and look at Israel's failures, uh, you wouldn't want to think, why does God even keep going with this program? They, they fail at every turn. But he says he's going he's gonna to figure that out. He's going to take care of it. Monica. I just wanted to bring to everyone remembrance that this week we uh, have the ninth of off. We've talked about that. It's a very sad day in Israel's history. It's the day when horrible things have happened to that country. The first temple and the second temple were both destroyed on the 9th of Av, and it translates to our calendar as August 12th through the 13th. So it's coming up. And, and I would uh, request <coughs> prayers for Israel, specifically for her protection threats from Iran coming specifically on the night of the Right. And pray this scripture. No weapon formed against them will prosper. We like to take that appropriate for ourselves, right? But it's actually talking about Israel. The plans of all of humanity to wipe out Israel. And, and you know, the, all of this just makes them stronger makes them more steadfast. I, I really uh, like the uh, movie, Cast a Giant Shadow. In that movie, this American Jew is being courted, uh, being recruited to come to Israel and help fight the war in 1948. And this guy is explaining, and it's Kirk Douglas is the character that is uh, he's ex being is being explained too. The guy says, you've heard of people who are willing to fight to the last man. He said, we're willing to fight to the last child. He said, because we have no choice. Um, you know, you can say, well, Israel, the people of Israel should go back where they came from, right? Well, they're not welcome back where they came from. They had no place to go. Anyway, we're in Genesis chapter 25, and there's a lot of uh, informational stuff that I didn't make slides on, so we don't have slides for the first part of it. I'll just read it. And you can grab your Bible and follow along. Genesis 25, verse 1. Now Abraham took another wife after Sarah died, whose name was Keturah. In every Jewish commentary I read says that Jewish tradition says that Keturah is the same as Hagar. So, yeah. No. Probably not, <laughs> but that's their tradition. <clears throat> but it says that uh, she bore to him Zimran, Jokshan, Midan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan. Now, when you read Sheba and Dedan, think of uh, Yemen. Sheba and Dedan kind of settled in that area of the, the southern Arabian Peninsula and became the nation of Yemen. And the sons of Dedan were Asherim, Letushim, and uh, Leoim, Leomim. Whenever you see that uh, I am ending, that is the Hebrew masculine plural. So we're talking about not proper names, but names of peoples. <coughs> he says the sons of Midian were uh, Ephah and Ephor and Hanak and Abida and Eldaah. All of these were the sons of Keturah. And now gave, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. Isaac received the inheritance of Abraham. And another thing that figures heavily into this chapter is the idea of inheritance. 
But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living. He was generous with his other sons. He was generous with Ishmael and the sons of Keturah. Uh, and he sent them away from his son Isaac. We're going to see a number of separations in this chapter. The sons of Keturah, as well as Ishmael, the son of Hagar, were separated. They were sent away to the east. Now what's to the east? Jordan. Well, immediately is Jordan, but then you come to the uh, Arabian Peninsula, and that's essentially where they mainly settled. But yes, some in Jordan, because we have uh, mentioned uh, Amman, which is a city to this day. Verse 7 says, These are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. And Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. We're going to see that phrase, gathered to his people, a number of times in the book of Genesis. Uh, some commentators will say that this this means that he was brought into the presence of God. Uh, he was taken to heaven. Uh, I don't see that that is accurate, but it does seem to indicate that they had a definite idea of uh, the spirit living beyond the body, when the body is dead. And then his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, facing Mamre. So Isaac and Ishmael got back together to bury their father. The field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth, there Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. And this place is, is a shrine to this very day. It came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived by Beer Wahiroi. He was blessed. Now we think, oh, you know, bless you folks, you know, I could I could do the, you know, do that, you know. Say nomine patria filiat spiritu sancti, you know. Go in peace. Uh, that's not what this means. Uh, Isaac inherited the blessings of Abraham. Everything that God promised to Abraham went to Isaac. And not only his physical property, but the spiritual blessings. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Uh, Every place that the sole of your foot touches is going to be your inheritance. All of those things were the blessings of Abraham. And we see that they pass from Abraham through Isaac to Jacob and then the 12 tribes. And some of them were, were scoundrels, you know, but they received the blessing of Abraham. And says that these are the records of the generations of Ishmael. Now, whenever it says that uh, these are the records, or in Hebrew it would be the Toledot, the Toledot of the generations of Ishmael, that is a separate document. In this particular case, it's pretty short. These are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Abdeel, and Mibsam, and Mishma, and Duma, and Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jeter, Nafish, and Kedemah. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages, by their camps, twelve princes according to their tribes. 
these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. Once again, a acknowledgement that God is the God of the living, not of the dead, as Jesus put it. And it says that they settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, as one goes toward Assyria. He settled in defiance of all his relatives. Seems like he was not at peace with anybody. And indeed, we see the tribes of Saudi Arabia at war with each other uh, pretty much to the present time. although the Saudis enforce their peace upon everybody, but right up until the formation of that kingdom, they were at war with each other. Okay, now we've got slides. Now these are the records of the generations of Isaac. So we're into the next Toledon. Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padaram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Barrenness is a significant symbol throughout the Old Testament. We see barrenness in Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, the wives of the three patriarchs. They all had a problem with barrenness. But through the Lord's intervention, they bore children as promised by God. It took God's intervention, just as it takes God's intervention in Israel, uh, to bring them to their mission. Uh, the guy we just listened to, uh, Paul, I think his name is, uh, he talked about the light of the world, the salt of the earth, which are, uh, nothing he said was wrong, but there's, there's one point that he kind of left out. Jesus was speaking to the Jewish nation when he said those things. You are the light of the world. You, you don't need to try to be the light of the world. You are it. You are the salt of the earth. You are the reason why God doesn't just put an end to this whole mess. So act like it. Of course, they didn't, right? Israel has not fulfilled its mission. Uh, it still has a role to play. But that role is, remember, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. They're going to fulfill their mission and receive the promises but it's not going to be because of any good thing they do. It's going to be because of God's purpose. And we see Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, and into the New Testament, Elizabeth. You know, Elizabeth, Zechariah, John the Baptist form kind of a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Most of the prophetic utterances of Mary and Elizabeth are very similar to Old Testament prophetic utterances. And indeed, Jesus says that the law and the prophets were until John. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Barrenness is also a symbol of unproductive land. Israel going through famines, droughts, problems. And God 
It says, you know, it's because you're not obeying me. You know, for about 490 years, they failed to keep the sabbatical year. And that's why they were in captivity for 70 years. You know, uh, seven times seven, 490. Uh, they didn't do it. So God said, well, we're going to give the land its sabbat uh, sabbatical rest all at once. Unproductive land. But it tells us in uh, verse 22, the children struggled within her. Jacob and Esau were fighting before they were born. And she said, if it is so, then am I this way? Or why then am I this way? Or, uh, which is a, a, a difficult thing to translate. Uh, basically, what's going on with me? If this is a if this is supposed to be a normal pregnancy, uh, why don't I feel like it? And so she went to inquire the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people will be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Once again, a separation. Jacob and Esau. Abraham was separated out of his land. The, the land of Ur of the Chaldees in modern day Iraq along the uh, Euphrates River. Uh, Isaac was separated from Ishmael. Uh, the sons of Keturah were separated uh, from the family of Abraham. We see this separation going on. Israel is to be separate. You know, you know that's the meaning, partially the meaning of the word holy. <clears throat> holy is separated unto God. The followers of Jesus are separated from the world. Romans 9 says, Not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It says that it was said to her, the older will, so, will serve the younger. And just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, don't read too much into the word hated. Uh, we see that Esau received a pretty good blessing uh, materially. And he, he turns out to be not such a bad guy. But there is a separation going on. Uh, Jacob is to be separated from Esau. Malachi, uh, who Paul is quoting, says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Esau became the father of the Edomites. Uh, thanks southern Jordan. If you've ever been uh, to the Arabah, and you know it is one of the most, or even seen pictures, uh, Indiana Jones, you know, riding the tank down through the Arabah pretty desolate country. That's where Esau settled. Though Edom says, we have been beaten down, but we will return and rebuild up the ruins. So they weren't lacking in pride, right? Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down. 
and this, men will call them the wicked territory, and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. But back to uh, Rebecca. When her days were to be delivered, were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in the womb. Now the first came out, came forth red, all over like a hairy garment. And they named him Esau. Hairy. Hairy. Red and hairy. Uh, I've never seen a kid like that. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, which means heel grabber. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man, living in tents. So the Bible doesn't seem to think too much of hunters. Hunters are never uh, well esteemed in the scripture. God seems to favor agrarians, people raising crops, uh, tending sheep, things like that. But Isaac took care of the family business. Uh, they were nomadic, they lived in tents, um, they took care of herds of sheep. Uh, the last chapter says uh, that they had a lot of camels. They were involved in trade because you know camels were the beasts of burden of the desert that hauled the goods. But it says that Isaac, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. Isaac liked, you know, wild venison, wild game. But Rebecca loved Jacob. So we set up a, a family dynamic. The father loves one kid and the mother loves the other. Now, don't think of uh, Jacob as uh, a mama's boy, or, you know, he was effeminate or anything like that. When uh, we see uh, him uh, going north uh, to uh, make his fortune, so to speak, with his uncle Laban, and he meets the girls coming to the well, he's able to pick up a, a stone uh, cover over the well that uh, usually took more than one man to move, and he did it by himself. So uh, Jacob was a tough guy, but he was not a, he was not a hunter. He didn't go out into the wilds and hunt wild game. And that's what his father liked. But it says that in verse 29, when Jacob had cooked some stew, Esau came in from the, from the field and was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff. King James says uh, red pottage, uh, red stuff. For I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. Because he was red and hairy and he liked red stuff. I read somewhere that it was actually red lentils. Which I think I've seen at railways. You can buy red lentils. Pretty common. But Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Now what is this birthright? What concerns the inheritance. The uh, oldest son, uh, by law, uh, when we come to the law of Moses, received a double portion. So if there were two sons, the family would split the inheritance into three portions, and the older son got two, and the younger son got one. That's just how it is. When we get to the law, Deuteronomy 21.15 says, if a man has two wives, and the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him sons, if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, 
then it shall be in the day he wills, that is, you know, makes his will, bequeaths his property, that he has to his sons, he cannot make the son of the loved the firstborn before the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the beginning of his strength. To him belongs the right of the firstborn. So the right of the firstborn, or the birthright, is the inheritance of the property. We also see later that Jacob, under the tutelage of Rebekah, cheats uh, Esau out of his blessing. And the blessing would be the spiritual blessings of Abraham. So Jacob ends up with it all. Now God says from the get-go that that's how he plans it. Now all of the deceit and everything else that went on with the people involved is, is kind of beside the point. But Esau says, Behold, I am about to die, so of what use then is the birthright to me? You know, uh, if I'm going to die of hunger, uh, having a double portion is not going to mean anything to me. And Jacob said, First swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He thought of it as of no importance. That's really what the word despised means. But the point is not the point of the story is not that uh, that Jacob was conniving and uh, got by by deceit got Esau to sell his birthright. The point of the story is that Esau didn't value it enough to even argue about it. He didn't care. In the book of Hebrews, it says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, and that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. We're talking about church life here. You know, someone with a root of bitterness, you know, it's going to, you know, a, a rotten apple spoils the whole batch. It's kind of the same idea here. Uh, a root of bitterness. If someone with a root of bitterness is going to cause trouble within the church. Or immoral or godless people who despise the birthright. We have a tremendous birthright given to us by Christ. It's a really big deal. The salvation that he gives us that he died for. Hebrews goes on and says, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, that sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. You know, the old covenant was terrifying to those under it, not only to those who received it, but to those who had to live by it day by day. It was a huge obligation, multiple obligations, daily obligations, plus weekly obligations, monthly obligations, annual obligations that you had to keep going with. Hebrews goes on, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, 
who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. This is our birthright. These are the things that Christ has bequeathed to us in his will. He goes on, he says, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, not a covenant based on continual obligations, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. He's saying, don't disregard this great gift that we have been given, this gift of salvation. Don't turn back. Don't despise your birthright. Hold it with sincerity and joy because it is truly a joy to have this inheritance from Jesus Christ himself, our older brother. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, come before you. We thank you that uh, you have given us this, this birthright, this uh, promise of salvation that uh, separates us from the world but all of the many benefits and blessings that that entails. And Lord, we pray uh, that you keep us on this road uh, to that blessing and that we do not uh, despise it, that we do not consider it of no value. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.